Unveil the mysteries that lurk in the shadows of the unknown as we embark on a journey into the realm of cryptids, elusive creatures that defy explanation and challenge the boundaries of our understanding. In this compelling compilation, we delve deep into the eerie and enigmatic world of cryptid encounters, where the line between fact and folklore blurs. From the chilling howls of werewolves to the elusive Sasquatch roaming the dense forests, join us as we unravel the spine-tingling tales of these mysterious beings. Brace yourself for a captivating exploration that will leave you questioning the limits of reality and the secrets that remain hidden in the darkness. I was driving down Bray Road one night when I saw something strange. At first, I thought it was a large dog running towards my car, but as it got closer, it stood up on its hind legs and started walking like a human. It was huge, easily over seven feet tall, with shaggy brown fur and glowing yellow eyes. I was terrified and sped away as fast as I could. Welcome back to another episode of Monster Shorts, where we delve deep into the strange and unexplained. Today, we're going to explore the legend of the Bray Road Werewolf, a creature that has been the subject of countless sightings and stories in rural Wisconsin. This creature has been described as part man, part wolf, and has been reported to stand upright and walk like a human. But is there any truth to this legend? Let's find out. The first reported sighting of the Bray Road Werewolf was in 1936. A man reported seeing a large wolf-like creature walking upright on its hind legs near Bray Road in Elkhorn, Wisconsin. This sighting was largely forgotten until the 1980s, when a rash of sightings occurred in the same area. These sightings were reported by multiple witnesses and described the creature as having a humanoid shape and standing up to seven feet tall. The Bray Road werewolf quickly became a media sensation. But what could explain these sightings? Some skeptics suggest that the sightings were simply misidentified animals, such as wolves or bears. However, the witnesses insist that the creature they saw was unlike any known animal. They describe its fur as being brown or gray, and its eyes as glowing in the dark. Some witnesses also report an overwhelming feeling of fear or dread when in the presence of the creature. So if not a known animal, what could the Bray Road Werewolf be? Some have suggested that it is a supernatural creature possibly a demon or a curse placed on the land. Others believe that it may be a genetic anomaly, a hybrid of man and wolf. But there is another possibility, one that has been explored by researchers such as Linda Godfrey, a journalist who has extensively investigated the Bray Road werewolf. Godfrey has written several books on the subject, and her research suggests that the creature may be related to Native American legends of shapeshifters. According to these legends, some people have the ability to transform into animals, such as wolves, at will. Godfrey suggests that the Bray Road Werewolf may be a modern-day manifestation of this legend. But why would a shapeshifter, or any other creature, choose to make its home on Bray Road? The answer may lie in the history of the area. Elkhorn, Wisconsin, was once home to a large Native American tribe, the Ho-Chunk people. They believed that the area was sacred, and that it was a place where spirits could enter the world of the living. They also believed that shapeshifters were more common in areas with high spiritual energy. As with any unexplained phenomenon, there are many theories and explanations. Some people believe that the creature is a physical manifestation of our fears and anxieties while others believe that it is a real, flesh-and-blood creature that has yet to be discovered by science. Until we have more solid evidence, the mystery of the Bray Road Werewolf remains unsolved. But as with all mysteries, the search for answers continues, and one day, we may finally uncover the truth behind this legendary creature. Welcome back to our channel, where we dive into some of the creepiest stories you can find. 
Today, we take a journey to the 12th century to unravel the enigmatic story of the green children of Woolpit. It all began in a quaint village in Suffolk, England, where the tale of two mysterious children with green skin emerged. These youngsters, a boy and a girl, were said to hail from a mythical underground land, and their story is nothing short of extraordinary. The first written account of the green children dates back to 1189, with another mention in 1220, placing the events sometime between 1135 and 1154, adding a touch of historical credibility to this story. The villagers discovered these peculiar children near some wool pits. What set them apart was their greenish hue, strange clothing, and an unknown language. When brought to Sir Richard de Calne's home, the children initially refused to eat. It took days before the villagers found food they would accept. Fava beans. Gradually, they lost their green coloring. Sadly, the boy, in poor health from the start, passed away soon after his christening. In one version of the story, the girl, who took the name Agnes, learned English and revealed that they were from a place called St. Martin's Land, a realm with perpetual twilight and green inhabitants, separated by a vast river. The mystery surrounding the green children of Woolpit has led to various theories. Some suggest natural explanations like malnourishment, arsenic exposure, or their diet. Others lean towards supernatural possibilities, including an extraterrestrial connection. But what truly happened to these children? Were they lost, abandoned, or victims of abuse? The story is shrouded in uncertainty, as there is no mention of their age, making it difficult to interpret their experiences accurately. Interestingly, there's a town nearby named Fornham St. Martin, which some speculate might be the elusive St. Martin's Land. But is it just another case of an unknown medical disorder that caused people's imagination to run wild? Or were they really from a far-off land or realm that has yet to be discovered? Let us know what you think in the comment section below. The Green Children of Woolpit remain a captivating part of England's history and Woolpit's culture. Over the centuries, people have searched for Agnes's descendants in the hopes of confirming the green girl's existence. However, without concrete evidence, this mysterious tale continues to hover in the realm of enigma. Deep within the remote regions of the Congo River Basin in Africa, a legendary creature known as Mokumbembe is said to dwell. The very name, derived from the Lingala language, translates to, one who stops the flow of rivers. A title that encapsulates the creature's mystique. Described as the size of an elephant and resembling a large dinosaur with a long neck and tail, this enigmatic creature has sparked both fascination and skepticism over the years. Locals have described the Mokumbembe as a dinosaur-like creature with a long neck and tail, similar to a sauropod. They believe that it is a living relic from the prehistoric era, and that it has somehow managed to survive to the present day. Local natives in the Congo have shared intriguing accounts of their encounters with the Mokumbembe. According to one tribe, this creature is a sacred aquatic being that brings good luck and prosperity to those who are fortunate enough to witness it. Marcelin Agnagna, a biologist and local resident of the Congo, vividly recalls his numerous sightings of the Mokumbembe. He describes the creature as a colossal being with a long neck and tail. I have seen the Mokumbembe many times. It is a very large creature with a long neck and tail covered in scales. It moves slowly through the water and has a horn on its head. I have seen it with my own eyes and so have many others in my village. Other locals similarly liken the creature to a dinosaur. Reports even include descriptions of its unique features, such as a horn on its head and a body covered in scales or rough skin.
The earliest documented encounter with the Mokumbembe can be attributed to German explorer Ludwig Freiherr von Stein zu Lossnitz in the early 20th century. He marveled at the creature's immense size and described the stature akin to that of an elephant. I saw a very large, unknown creature while exploring the Congo River Basin. It was about the size of an elephant, with a long neck and tail, and was covered in scales or rough skin. I also saw a horn or spike on its head. It was a remarkable sight, and one that I will never forget. In the 1950s, French missionary Abbé Ligis provided his own account of a dinosaur-like creature, emphasizing its slow movements through the water. I saw the Mokomembi while I was in the Likola UX Hubs region of the Congo. It was a dinosaur-like creature, with a long neck and tail, and it moved slowly through the water. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw it, but I know what I saw. In 1980, a team of researchers from the United States and the United Kingdom went on an expedition to the Congo in search of the Mokumbembe. They interviewed numerous locals who claimed to have seen the creature and collected physical evidence, such as footprints and hair samples. One of the locals they interviewed was Marcelin Egnegna, who claimed to have seen the creature on several occasions. One of the most famous eyewitness accounts of the Mokumbembe was documented in a 1981 episode of the television series, In Search Of. The episode featured an interview with a man named Herman Regusters, who claimed to have seen the creature while on an expedition in the Congo. According to his account, he and his team were traveling up the Ubangi River when they spotted a large, dinosaur-like creature in the water. He described it as having a long neck and tail, a body covered in scales, and a head shaped like a snake. I was on an expedition up the Ubangi River when we spotted the creature. It was very large, with a long neck and tail, and a body covered in scales. Its head was shaped like a snake, and it moved slowly through the water. I can't say for sure what it was, but it definitely wasn't anything I had seen before. While the details about the Mokumbembe's daily habits, diet, and territorial behaviors are largely speculative due to the lack of concrete evidence, there are some accounts and hypotheses based on the local legends and reported sightings. The Mokumbembe is often described as an aquatic creature, spending much of its time in rivers, swamps, and bodies of water. It's believed to be most active during the early morning and late afternoon, coming to the surface to breathe and possibly forage for food. It's often depicted as a slow-moving creature, gliding through the water with its long neck and tail visible above the surface. The diet of the Mokumbembe is a subject of speculation. Based on its size and aquatic nature, it's thought to be a herbivore, primarily feeding on aquatic plants and vegetation along riverbanks and in swamps. Some accounts suggest that it might also feed on fruits and other plant materials found near the water. Reported sightings suggest that the Mokumbembe may have territorial behaviors, particularly in areas where it's commonly seen. This could involve claiming a specific stretch of a river or a particular swamp as its territory. Given its size and potential role as a large herbivore, it's possible that it might need a sizable territory to meet its food requirements. Territorial behavior could involve marking its territory through vocalizations and body movements, or possibly even physical markings on the land or in the water. However, due to the limited information available, the exact territorial habits of the Mokumbembe remain speculative at best. It's important to note that the information about the Mokumbembe's daily habits, diet, and territorial behaviors comes from a combination of local folklore and accounts from expeditions. Without concrete scientific evidence, these descriptions should be taken with caution and considered within the context of cultural beliefs and legends. Reports of sounds associated with the Mokumbembe vary widely, and these descriptions often contribute to the mystique surrounding the creature. While many of the reported sounds are anecdotal and lack scientific confirmation, they add to the overall picture of this legendary creature. Some accounts describe the Mokumbembe as emitting deep resonant roars or vocalizations. These sounds are often characterized as low frequency and reverberating, suggesting a creature of substantial size. The purpose of these vocalizations could be communication, territory marking, or attracting mates. Another reported sound associated with the Mokumbembe is a hissing or snorting noise. 
This sound has been compared to the breathing or snorting of large animals and could be linked to the creature's respiratory behavior while surfacing in the water. Witnesses have also reported hearing splashing or thrashing sounds in bodies of water where the Mokumbembe is said to reside. These sounds might be attributed to the creature's movement in the water while it's swimming and interacting with its environment. Some accounts suggest that the Mokumbembe's movements on land are accompanied by distinct sounds, including heavy footsteps or rustling of vegetation. These sounds might be particularly noticeable if the creature ventures onto the riverbank or into marshy areas. In some local legends, the Mokumbembe is said to create drumming or rhythmic noises by striking its tail against the water or the ground. This attribute has been associated with ritualistic behavior or communication between individual creatures. Although reports and accounts of the Mokumbembe abound, skepticism remains among scientists and skeptics alike. Some view it as a legend or misidentification of known species while others entertain the possibility of an undiscovered creature. While details about the creature's daily habits, diet, and territorial behaviors are largely speculative due to the lack of concrete evidence, accounts and hypotheses based on local legends and reported sightings offer intriguing glimpses into its potential existence. In the end, the Mokumbembe continues to occupy a unique space in the realm of cryptids. A legendary creature that has captivated the imagination and stirred debates between skeptics and believers. Its story persists as a testament to the mysteries that still await discovery within the world's most remote corners. The Fresno Nightcrawlers, also known as the Fresno Aliens or Fresno Stickmen, are a mysterious and enigmatic cryptid captured on camera in Fresno, California. The footage, which first gained attention in the late 2000s, depicts strange, slender creatures with long legs and a small head walking in a peculiar manner. The original video, referred to as the Fresno Nightcrawler footage, was recorded by a surveillance camera in a residential neighborhood in Fresno. It shows two white humanoid figures slowly moving across a lawn, appearing to have no arms and a lower body that tapers into a thin elongated shape. The creature's distinctive appearance and the smooth, almost floating way in which they move have puzzled and intrigued viewers worldwide. The footage was later analyzed by various experts and investigators, but no definitive explanation for the creature's identity or origin has been determined. Some theories suggest that the Fresno Nightcrawlers could be extraterrestrial beings or cryptids from another dimension, while others propose they might be an elaborate hoax or a misinterpretation of a more mundane phenomenon. The video gained significant attention on the internet and has since sparked discussions and debates among enthusiasts of the paranormal and cryptozoology. Several alleged sightings of similar creatures have been reported in other locations around the world, although the authenticity of these accounts remains uncertain. The Fresno Nightcrawlers have become an intriguing part of modern urban legends and continue to captivate the imagination of those interested in the unknown. Whether they are an actual undiscovered species or a clever fabrication, their mystique persists, leaving the truth behind their existence shrouded in uncertainty. Welcome back to another episode of Monster Shorts. Today, we're diving back into the heart of Africa to explore the terrifying tale of Gustav, the infamous killer crocodile. Brace yourselves as we embark on this journey filled with mystery, danger, and spine-chilling encounters.
The Rizizi River winds its way through the treacherous heart of an unforgiving and perilous land, stretching over seventy miles. It is a dark and foreboding waterway, originating from the southern bay of Lake Kivu, which acts as a sinister divider between Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Its path takes it south, towards the oblong and ominous Lake Tanganyika, traversing the ominous territories of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Rwanda, and Burundi. Once teeming with life, the Rizizi River was a thriving ecosystem, inhabited by a multitude of diverse species. In the not-so-distant past, buffalo, majestic elephants, and tenacious warthogs roamed alongside the sprawling human population. But now, a desolate emptiness hangs in the air, as these magnificent creatures have fallen victim to the relentless onslaught of human greed and merciless hunting. In this haunting landscape, only a handful of creatures dare to inhabit the treacherous waters of the Rizizi. Among them, the most formidable and feared are the indomitable hippos, engaged in a relentless struggle for survival against their natural nemesis, the dreaded Nile crocodiles. Masters of this central African realm thrive in their watery domain. They are apex predators, showing no preference when it comes to their insatiable appetite for meat. Generalists by nature, they devour anything within reach. Their voracious hunger knows no bounds. Notorious for their aggression, these crocodiles surpass even their counterparts in their relentless brutality. They lurk primarily in freshwater, yet their ferocity rivals that of their saltwater kin. It is believed that they claim the lives of hundreds of unsuspecting victims each year, though the true extent of their deadly toll remains shrouded in mystery. And among these formidable reptiles, there exists a legend, an embodiment of terror and malevolence a behemoth crocodile unlike any ever seen. Gustav, an ancient Nile crocodile of colossal proportions, a veritable leviathan rumored to surpass twenty feet in length. The earliest accounts of Gustav emerged in 1987 as terrified villagers along the northeastern shores of Lake Tanganyika reported savage attacks by a colossal and ruthless crocodile. Over the years, sporadic reports continued to surface, intermingled with the horrors of the conflicts that engulfed the region. The 1990s were an era of unspeakable bloodshed and chaos in Central Africa. Amidst this maelstrom, during the aftermath of the Rwandan genocide an eerie transformation occurred within the Rizizi River. Military leaders, in their macabre wisdom, ordered the disposal of countless bodies, casting them into the once pristine waters. As death danced upon the currents, a malevolent presence awoke. And thus, the legend of Gustav was born. Many have theorized that Gustav reached an enormous size at such a young age by feeding on the large number of bodies being dumped in the river during the genocide. His true size remains unverifiable for he has eluded capture and death, haunting the depths of the river, a sinister embodiment of age and terror. Whispers of his advanced age, nearing a century, intertwine with tales of his fully intact teeth, defying the natural order that sees crocodiles toothless in their twilight years. To witness Gustav in his prime was to bear witness to a monster still growing. His insatiable appetite defying comprehension. Astonishing accounts surfaced, tales of Gustav's unmatched prowess as he took down adult hippos, a feat that defied the very laws of nature. The natural antagonism between crocodiles and these colossal creatures only added to the growing mythology surrounding Gustav. But it was not only the size and appetite of Gustav that fueled the terror, but the disturbing reports that he had transcended mere survival instincts. Humans, once considered the dominant species, found themselves hunted by this monstrous crocodile. The locals spoke in hushed tones, labeling him a man-eater, as he ruthlessly claimed dozens of innocent lives. Yet the most chilling aspect of Gustav's reign of terror was the revelation that his killings were not driven solely by primal hunger. Reports emerged, spine-chilling in their implications, that Gustav left his victims uneaten, their lifeless bodies discarded as if he derived sadistic pleasure from their demise. It seemed he reveled in his power. Toying with his prey like a malevolent deity, driven by something far more sinister than mere sustenance. 
Some speculated that he grew bored, others whispered of a twisted preference for certain individuals, rejecting those whose tastes did not meet his refined palate. Astonishingly, now crocodiles can survive for months without feeding, fueling speculation that Gustav's murderous rampage went beyond primal needs. As the legend of Gustav grew, herpetologists and hunters endeavored to track down this mythical beast. They sought to unravel the enigma of his existence, to capture or eliminate the terror that plagued the region. Experts theorized that Gustav, surpassing eighteen feet in length and weighing over a ton, may possess an impenetrable hide. Witnesses recounted harrowing encounters, describing Gustav surviving volleys of bullets, devouring them like an unholy creature impervious to mortal harm. Desperate attempts to ensnare him in traps designed by Patrice Fay, a devoted herpetologist, proved futile. Gustav's intelligence and deep-rooted distrust of humans rendered him untouchable, a malevolent force that defied the conventional limits of predator and prey. Gustav bore the scars of countless battles, his massive frame marred by wounds inflicted by humans who sought to bring him down. Bullets had torn through his reptilian flesh, leaving reminders of their futile attempts on his very being. A colossal scar on his head stood as a testament to a failed execution, a testament to his invincibility. Soldiers from across the African continent shared stories of their futile efforts, a volley upon volley unleashed upon the demon croc, only to witness their ammunition consumed without a scratch. Whispers circulated that only an explosion could momentarily halt his relentless advance, a testament to his unearthly resilience. Grotesque Wounds Deep and festering, marred Gustav's right shoulder. Experts believe this injury, compounded by his other gunshot wounds, had driven him to adapt his hunting techniques. Hindered in movement and diminished in agility, Gustav honed his skills as a predator, targeting larger prey to compensate for his physical limitations. The wounded beast became even more dangerous, his insatiable hunger coupled with a cunning born from desperation. In 2004, a chilling documentary titled, Capturing the Killer Croc, thrust Gustav into the spotlight. Herpetologist Patrice Fay, consumed by an unwavering obsession, embarked on a harrowing quest to locate and capture the beast. Fay pieced together a grim puzzle. Attributing over 200 missing villagers to Gustav's insatiable appetite for destruction, the documentary blurred the line between reality and folklore weaving a tapestry of fear and awe that has gripped the imaginations of Central Africans. Gustav, forever shrouded in mystery, continues to haunt the collective consciousness. His presence, akin to mythical beings like the Loch Ness Monster and the Mothman, casts an eternal shadow of dread upon the land. Known by the moniker The Demon Croc, he lingers as a phantom of malevolence, a specter that refuses to be extinguished. This video is going to start off a little bit different than usual. I'm going to start by telling everyone my own personal experience with the black dog. My encounter happened around 15 years ago when I was still a paratrooper in the U.S. Army. I had taken leave and was about seven hours into a road trip back home to visit family for the holidays. I had gotten a late start because I had some trucks I needed to fix in the motor pool before I could leave. They were set to go to Green Ramp and be shipped to one of our units overseas. It was getting really late, and I was getting very tired. I was the only one driving on the highway and the road had a shine on it from where it had recently rained. All of a sudden I noticed something running on the shoulder of the highway, just on the other side of the white line. I thought it was a deer at first, but it was too small. It was dark brown, almost black, and was running on all fours but something just seemed off and uncanny about it. The creature was running just fast enough ahead of me to keep in the range of my headlights, and it seemed as if it was running in slow motion. I leaned forward in my seat and tried to focus on whatever it was. All of a sudden it was in the middle of the road, running directly at my car. In the blink of an eye it had changed direction and was coming towards me. When it got within a few feet of me, it leaped towards my windshield and was gone. I can vividly remember its dark yellow piercing eyes. Its head looked like a German shepherd but the body resembled a greyhound. 
It happened so fast that I really couldn't get a great look at it. I slammed on my brakes and stopped in the middle of the road. I don't know if I had encountered some kind of malevolent spirit on that fateful night years ago, or if I had fallen asleep and dreamt the whole experience. Maybe there was an animal on the side of the highway, and I was so tired I created the whole encounter from past memories. I remember reading about the black dog on the internet. Perhaps my mind recreated a story I had read and I imagined the whole thing. Whether it was real or not, it seemed all too real to me. Even looking up pictures for this video gave me chills and made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Now that you've heard my history with the black dog and why this video is so personal to me, let's get into the lore behind the infamous black dog of the highway. The black dog that truck drivers see is a legendary phenomenon often referred to as the black dog syndrome. It is a widespread belief among truckers that encounters with a black dog while driving at night can be a foreboding omen or a harbinger of bad luck. These sightings have been reported by drivers around the world and have become deeply ingrained in trucking folklore. The black dog is often described as an ominous and ghostly creature, with glowing red eyes and a menacing presence. It is said to appear suddenly on the side of the road or in the middle of the highway, causing drivers to swerve or brake abruptly to avoid hitting it. Some truckers claim that the dog vanishes just as quickly as it appears leaving them shaken and bewildered. The origins of this superstition can be traced back to various cultural and mythological beliefs. In some cultures, black dogs are associated with death, the supernatural, or even demonic entities. In folklore, they are often seen as omens of impending tragedy or misfortune. This belief has merged with the experiences and stories shared among truck drivers, creating a unique legend within their community. Psychologically, the sightings of the black dog can be attributed to various factors. Long hours of driving, fatigue, and the monotonous nature of the job can lead to perceptual distortions or hallucinations. Additionally, the subconscious mind may amplify existing fears or anxieties, manifesting them in the form of the black dog. While skeptics dismiss the sightings as mere illusions or tricks of the mind, the belief in the black dog remains strong among many truckers. Some drivers take precautions such as carrying good luck charms, reciting prayers, or avoiding certain routes known for frequent sightings. Others simply see it as part of the trucking experience a story to share with fellow drivers. Ultimately, whether the black dog is a supernatural entity, a product of tiredness and imagination, or a combination of both, it continues to capture the imagination of truckers and adds to the rich tapestry of trucking folklore. In 1966, the small town of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, was gripped by a series of bizarre and terrifying encounters. Witnesses reported sightings of a large winged creature with glowing red eyes, which came to be known as the Mothman. But there was another figure associated with the Mothman sightings, a mysterious man known as Indrid Cold, who communicated telepathically and exhibited strange, almost inhuman characteristics. In this video, we'll delve into the strange and unsettling accounts of Indrid Cold and the Mothman, and explore the theories surrounding their existence. Welcome to another episode of Monster Shorts. Today we are going to explore the bizarre encounters of the mysterious entity known as Indrid Cold. Indrid Cold and the Mothman. These two figures have captured the imaginations of people for decades and continue to generate interest and speculation to this day. While there is no concrete evidence to support the existence of these entities, many people believe that they may be connected to extraterrestrial or interdimensional phenomena or perhaps even to government experiments or conspiracies. Let's take a closer look at the encounters and the witnesses' accounts. In 
There were several reported encounters with injured cold in Point Pleasant, West Virginia during the mid-1960s. One of the most well-known accounts involves a man named Woodrow Derenberger, who claimed to have encountered injured cold on November 2, 1966. According to Derenberger's account, he was driving home from work when a strange object appeared in the sky and began following his vehicle. The object then landed on the road in front of him, and a man exited the craft and approached Derenberger's car. The man, who would later be identified as Indrid Cold, communicated with Derenberger telepathically, introducing himself and explaining that he was from the planet Lanulos. Cold reportedly told Derenberger that he meant him no harm and that he simply wanted to speak with him. Over the course of the encounter, which lasted for several minutes, Cold reportedly shared information about his home planet and discussed various topics with Derenberger. After the encounter, Derenberger reported the incident to the local authorities, and the story was soon picked up by the media. I was driving my truck on the highway when I saw a strange object in the sky. It was like a bright light, and it seemed to be following me. The light landed on the road in front of me, and I saw a man get out of it. He was wearing a shiny metallic suit and had a strange, almost inhuman appearance. The man walked up to my truck and introduced himself as Andrew Cold. He spoke to me telepathically and told me that he was from the planet Lanulos. He said that he was visiting Earth and that he wanted to speak to someone who could communicate his message to the world. He told me about his planet and his people, and he shared information about their technology and way of life. He also warned me about a coming disaster that would affect the Earth. After the encounter, I went to the police to report what had happened. They were skeptical, but I knew what I had experienced. Woodrow Derenberger's account is one of the most well-known and detailed encounters with Indrid Cold. Despite skepticism from some, Derenberger maintained that his encounters with Cold were genuine and that he had no reason to make up the stories. According to Linda Scarberry, she and her friends saw a big gray thing with big red eyes that seemed to glow in the dark. Soon after, they saw a man with weird eyes and a metallic green suit walking towards them. This man, who introduced himself as Indrid Cold, communicated with them telepathically and claimed to be from another planet. We were driving out by the TNT area, just having a good time, when all of a sudden we saw this big, gray thing. It was shaped like a man but bigger, maybe six and a half or seven feet tall. It had these big wings folded against its back, and it had red eyes, big red eyes that seemed to glow in the dark, we were all pretty scared, but we couldn't look away. It was like we were hypnotized or something. And then, all of a sudden, it spread its wings and took off, straight up into the air. We watched it until it was just a tiny dot in the sky. And then, a few minutes later, we saw another figure in the distance. It was a man, we could tell that much, but he was wearing a metallic green suit and a black tie. He walked towards us, and we could see that his skin was tan, almost like he'd been out in the sun too long. And he had these big weird eyes too, like the thing we'd just seen. He started talking to us, but he wasn't using his mouth. It was like his voice was in our heads, you know? And he was friendly I guess. He told us his name was Indrid Cold, and that he was from another planet. He talked to us for a little while, and then he just sort of disappeared, like he was never there in the first place. It was the scariest thing I've ever experienced, but I know what I saw. And I know there are other people out there who saw it too. Other witnesses reported similar encounters with Indrid Cold during this time period. Some reported seeing him in the company of the Mothman while others reported seeing him alone. In each case, witnesses reported that Cold communicated telepathically and exhibited a calm, friendly demeanor. Indrid Cold was reported to have a soft, soothing voice. Witnesses also reported that he had an unusual, almost inhuman appearance, with a thin, unsettling smile and elongated almond-shaped eyes. In addition to his physical appearance and telepathic abilities, some witnesses reported that Indrid Cold exhibited other unusual characteristics. For example, he was said to have the ability to levitate off the ground, 
and in some cases, he appeared and disappeared abruptly. The encounters with Indrid Cold occurred primarily in Point Pleasant, West Virginia in the late 1960s. During this time, numerous people reported sightings of the Mothman, with some witnesses reporting encounters with Indrid Cold at the same time. Whatever the explanation may be, the accounts of Indrid Cold continue to fascinate and intrigue people to this day. While we may never know the full truth about these mysterious figures, the stories of their encounters serve as a reminder that the world is full of mysteries and unexplained phenomena that are waiting to be uncovered. Welcome to our video about the fascinating tale of the Flatwoods Monster. This creature, also known as the Braxton County Monster or the Green Monster, has been a subject of interest for many years. In this video, we will explore its origins, encounters, and eyewitness testimony in order to paint a clearer picture of this mysterious being. So sit back and relax, and get ready to learn about the history of the Flatwoods Monster. The Flatwoods Monster made its first appearance on September 12, 1952, in Flatwoods, West Virginia. At around 7.15 p.m., a group of boys were playing football when they noticed a bright object streaking across the sky and crash landing on a nearby hill. Thinking it was a plane that had crashed, the boys ran to investigate. Accompanied by a dog, they made their way up the hill and into a wooded area. As they neared the top of the hill, they reported smelling a pungent odor that made their eyes water and throats burn. Suddenly, they saw a bright pulsating light and heard a hissing sound. They then noticed a large object about ten feet in diameter hovering above the ground. As they stared in shock, a creature around ten feet tall with a round red face and glowing eyes emerged from the object and began to move towards them. The boys and their dog panicked and ran back down the hill. They quickly reported the incident to the local sheriff who returned to the scene with a group of volunteers. Upon arriving, they too experienced the pungent odor and discovered skid marks and traces of a thick oily black liquid on the ground. However, they found no trace of the creature or the object. In the days and weeks following the encounter, more eyewitnesses came forward with similar reports. One woman claimed to have seen the creature running along a nearby road while another reported seeing it in her backyard. The descriptions were consistent, with most witnesses describing the creature as around ten feet tall, with a round, red face and glowing eyes, and wearing a dark, metallic suit. Some witnesses reported feeling ill or experiencing burning sensations in their eyes and throat after encountering the creature. Despite extensive investigations by the Air Force and other agencies, no conclusive evidence was ever found to explain the Flatwoods monster. Some theories suggest it may have been an extraterrestrial being or a government experiment gone wrong. Others believe it was simply a case of mass hysteria or a misidentification of a natural phenomenon. Regardless of the explanation, the Flatwoods monster remains a fascinating and mysterious part of American folklore. I was sleeping in my bedroom when I suddenly woke up to a scratching sound on the window. I got up to investigate and saw a small hairy creature with a metal helmet outside. It looked like a monkey, but it had red eyes and long claws. I tried to scream, but it jumped through the window and attacked me. It scratched me and tried to bite me before running away. I was terrified and called the police immediately. In the summer of 2001, the city of Delhi in India was gripped by a wave of panic and fear due to the sudden appearance of a strange and elusive creature known as the Monkey Man. The creature was described as being around four feet tall, with a hairy body, a metal helmet, and long claws. It was said to move quickly and silently, scaling buildings and walls with ease. Reports of attacks by the Monkey Man started pouring in with people claiming that the creature had scratched or bitten them while they were sleeping at night, 
The first reported sighting of the Monkey Man was on May 13, 2001, in the East Delhi neighborhood of Vivek Vihar. A woman claimed that a strange creature had entered her house through the window and attacked her, leaving her with deep scratches on her neck and face. Over the next few days, similar reports started coming in from different parts of the city, with people claiming that the monkey man had attacked them in their homes or on the streets at night. As news of the monkey man spread, the city was gripped by fear and paranoia. People started taking precautions such as locking their windows and doors at night, and avoiding dark alleys and deserted areas. The police launched a massive search operation, but the creature remained elusive. Several people were arrested on suspicion of being the monkey man, but all were later released due to lack of evidence. The phenomenon of the monkey man continued for several weeks with new sightings and attacks being reported almost daily. The media fueled the panic by reporting sensational stories and speculation, which only added to the fear and confusion. However, as the days passed, the sightings and attacks started to decrease, and eventually, the phenomenon died down. Despite the massive search operation and media coverage, the existence of the Monkey Man was never confirmed, and it remains a mystery to this day. Some people believe that it was a case of mass hysteria or an urban legend, while others think that it might have been a real creature, such as a misidentified macaque monkey or a prankster wearing a monkey suit. Witness statements during the time of the Monkey Man phenomenon varied widely. Some claimed to have seen the creature up close, describing it as a hairy, monkey-like creature with red eyes and long claws. Others reported hearing strange noises or feeling a presence in their homes at night. Still, others were skeptical of the Monkey Man's existence and thought that the reports were exaggerated or fabricated. For example, a man named Gopal Mukherjee claimed that the monkey man had attacked him in his house in the middle of the night. He described the creature as being around four feet tall, with long claws and a metal helmet. He said that the monkey man had scratched him and tried to bite him before running away. Mukherjee's wife and neighbors confirmed that they had heard him screaming and had seen the scratches on his body. Another witness, a woman named Sushma Sethi, claimed that she had seen the monkey man climbing up the side of her house in the early hours of the morning. She described the creature as being small and hairy, with red eyes and a menacing expression. She said that she had screamed and scared the creature away before it could do any harm. Overall, the phenomenon of the monkey man remains one of the strangest and most puzzling incidents in recent Indian history. Despite the lack of concrete evidence, the Monkey Man continues to be a source of fascination and speculation for many people. The Jersey Devil has inhabited the Pine Barrens region of southern New Jersey and has been the subject of numerous sightings and encounters over the past few centuries. But is it real or just another myth? Welcome to another episode of Monster Shorts. In today's episode, we'll be discussing one of the most enduring and mysterious creatures in American folklore, the Jersey Devil. The Jersey Devil is a legendary creature said to inhabit the Pine Barrens region of southern New Jersey, and has been the subject of numerous sightings and encounters over the past few centuries. Today, we'll be exploring the history of the region and the lead family, as well as the various theories from experts explaining what the Jersey Devil could be. The Pine Barrens region of southern New Jersey is a vast, densely forested area that covers over one million acres. It is also known as the Pinelands, and is home to a diverse range of plant and animal life including deer, black bears, and the elusive pine barrens tree frog. But the area is also steeped in history and legend, dating back to the early colonial period. It was here that the Lieb family, one of the region's earliest settlers, became the focus of one of the most enduring legends in American folklore. According to the legend, in 1735, 
a woman named Mother Leeds gave birth to her thirteenth child, and upon its birth, the child transformed into a hideous creature with the head of a horse, the wings of a bat, and the body of a serpent. The creature is said to have let out a blood curdling scream before flying up the chimney and disappearing into the night. Over the years, the legend of the Jersey Devil grew, and numerous sightings and encounters were reported throughout the region. One of the earliest recorded sightings of the Jersey Devil occurred in 1812, when a group of sailors reported seeing a strange creature with a glowing red head and wings while docked at the Delaware River. In the years that followed, numerous other sightings were reported, including one in 1909, when hundreds of people claimed to have seen the Jersey Devil flying over Camden, New Jersey. Some witnesses described the creature as standing on two legs, while others claimed it had four. Some said it had a long, forked tail, while others claimed it had no tail at all. And some claimed it had a goat's head, while others insisted it had the head of a dragon or a bird. Despite the numerous sightings, however, no one has ever been able to capture or kill the Jersey Devil, and its true nature and origins remain shrouded in mystery. Some experts believe that the creature is simply a misidentified or exaggerated version of a known animal, such as a large bird or bat. Others speculate that the Jersey Devil may be a remnant of a prehistoric species, such as the pterosaur or the plesiosaur, which managed to survive in the remote and isolated Pine Barrens region. Still, others believe that the Jersey Devil may be a supernatural creature, either a demon or some other malevolent spirit that has taken on physical form. As we have seen, the legend of the Jersey Devil has persisted for centuries with numerous sightings and encounters reported throughout the region. While many of these sightings may be the result of misidentification or exaggeration, there is no denying the enduring fascination with this mysterious creature. Perhaps one day we will finally uncover the truth behind the legend of the Jersey Devil, but until then, the mystery remains, and the legend lives on. The story of the man-eaters of Tsevo is one that captivates and intrigues us to this day. The tale of these infamous lions and their reign of terror has inspired countless books, films, and documentaries. But what if there is more to this story than meets the eye? What if the man-eaters of Tsevo were not just a pair of rogue lions, but something much more mysterious and sinister? In this episode, we explore the terrifying stories of these notorious beasts that haunted the construction of the Uganda Railway in the early 1900s. To truly understand the significance of the man-eaters of Tsevo, we must first delve into the history of the region. Tsevo, located in what is now Kenya, was once a place of great importance to the indigenous people who lived there. It was a place of great spiritual significance, and many believe that the land was inhabited by powerful spirits, and supernatural beings. The Tsevo region is a rugged and inhospitable wilderness. It is a place of extremes where the unforgiving terrain meets the harsh realities of life. For the construction of the Uganda Railway in the early 1900s, this remote location presented a daunting challenge to the British colonizers. The railway was being built to connect the Indian Ocean to the inland regions of East Africa. It was a mammoth undertaking that required a lot of manpower and resources. The work was hard, and the conditions were brutal, with the workers having to deal with the harsh climate, dangerous animals, and diseases. But the workers faced a far more terrifying threat than they could have imagined. In 1898, two maneless male lions began attacking and killing the workers who were building the railway. These lions were unlike any other lions that had been seen before. They were enormous, ferocious, and cunning. For nearly ten months, the man-eaters of Tsevo terrorized the railway construction workers. They killed and ate over 135 people. They would attack their victims at night, dragging them from their tents and devouring them in a gruesome display of savagery. The workers were petrified, 
and the authorities were at a loss as to how to stop the carnage. It seemed like nothing could stand in the way of these ruthless beasts. Why did they develop a taste for human flesh? These are questions that have puzzled historians, zoologists, and adventurers for over a century. There have been many theories put forth to explain the behavior of these lions. Some believe that they were man-eaters because their teeth were damaged, and they couldn't hunt their usual prey. Others speculate that they had developed a taste for human flesh because they had been exposed to it during the construction of the railway. Many theories have been put forward to explain the behavior of these lions. Some have suggested that they were driven to man-eating due to a lack of prey, while others have attributed their actions to their advanced age or some kind of genetic mutation. But what if there was another explanation? What if the man-eaters of Tseva were not ordinary lions at all, but something much more otherworldly? What if they were, in fact, the physical manifestation of the spirits that had long inhabited the land of Tsevo? This theory may seem far-fetched, but there are many indications that suggest it could be true. For one thing, the attacks of the man-eaters of Tsevo were not typical of lion behavior. Lions are usually nocturnal hunters, but they tend to avoid humans whenever possible. The fact that these lions were actively seeking out and attacking humans suggests that they were motivated by something more than just hunger. According to this theory, the man-eaters of Tseva were not lions but spirits that had possessed the bodies of two ordinary lions. These spirits were angry at the British colonizers for encroaching on their land and disrupting the natural order of things. The spirits had chosen the bodies of two lions because they knew that these animals were powerful and feared by humans. They had possessed these lions and unleashed them on the construction workers to punish the British for their arrogance and disrespect. While this theory may sound far-fetched, it cannot be entirely dismissed. After all, the man-eaters were unlike any other lions that had been seen before. They were smarter, more aggressive, and more fearless than any other lions in the region. Unlike most lions, they did not attack their prey from behind. Instead, they would stalk their victims for hours, waiting for the perfect moment to pounce. They would also drag their victims away from the camp, making it difficult for the workers to find their bodies. Furthermore, the behavior of the man-eaters of Tsevo was highly ritualistic. They would drag their victims to a specific location and then consume only certain parts of their bodies, leaving others untouched. This kind of behavior is more reminiscent of a religious or spiritual ritual than the actions of a hungry predator. Another piece of evidence supporting the supernatural theory is the fact that the man-eaters of Tseva were almost immune to the weapons of the British. The workers and the authorities tried everything to kill the lions, but their efforts were futile. The bullets seemed to bounce off their thick hides, and the traps set for them were ineffective. In the end, it was the skill of one man, Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson, that brought an end to the reign of terror of the man-eaters of Tsevo. Patterson was an experienced hunter and tracker who had been brought in by the authorities to deal with the lions. He spent months studying the behavior of the man-eaters, and in the end, he was able to kill them both. Patterson was a British Army officer and engineer who was working on the construction of the Uganda Railway in Kenya when the man-eaters of Tsevo attacked. He was tasked with dealing with the problem, and his experience with the man-eaters is documented in his book, The Man-eaters of Tsevo, which was first published in 1907. However, even Patterson himself could not fully explain the behavior of the man-eaters of Tsevo. He wrote extensively about his experience with the lions but he could not come up with a satisfactory explanation as to why they were so different from other lions. In his book, Patterson describes in detail his encounters with the man-eaters and the tactics he used to finally kill them. He also provides insights into the behavior of the lions, their hunting strategies, and their ability to avoid detection. Patterson's writing is a fascinating account of the events that took place and provides a valuable record of the man-eaters' behavior. Patterson's book is considered a classic in the field of African wildlife and has been read by generations of readers interested in African wildlife and adventure. It has also been adapted into several movies and documentaries, including the 1996 film The Ghost in the Darkness, which stars Val Kilmer as Patterson.
Despite his success in killing the man-eaters, Patterson was never fully satisfied with his explanation of their behavior. He was puzzled by their unusual tactics and resistance to the British weapons, and his writings reflect his ongoing curiosity about the man-eaters of Tsavo. Overall, Patterson's book is a must-read for anyone interested in the man-eaters of Tsavo and the history of African wildlife. It provides a first-hand account of the events that took place and sheds light on the behavior of these mysterious and terrifying creatures. The mystery of the man-eaters of Tsavo has intrigued people for over a century, and it continues to do so to this day. Was their behavior due to some natural or environmental factor, or were they indeed supernatural beings sent to punish the British colonizers? We may never know the answer for sure, but the legend of the man-eaters of Tsavo will always remain a fascinating and terrifying part of African folklore. It is worth noting that the attacks of the man-eaters of Tsavo coincided with a period of great upheaval in the region. The arrival of European settlers and the construction of the railway represented a major disruption to the traditional way of life of the indigenous people. It is possible that the spirits of Tsavo were angered by these changes and chose to manifest themselves in the form of the man-eaters as a way of lashing out against the invaders. In conclusion, the story of the man-eaters of Tsavo is not just a tale of two rogue lions. It is a story that speaks to something much deeper and more mysterious. It is a story of the collision between two worlds, of the clash between modernity and tradition, and of the enduring power of the spirits that inhabit the land. As we continue to explore the mysteries of our world, the story of the man-eaters of Tsavo will remain a haunting reminder of the mysteries that still elude us. In the remote wilderness of Alaska lies a village abandoned, not by choice, but by an unseen terror, the chilling legend of the Portlock Sasquatch. Step into a world where the line between myth and reality blurs as we unravel the haunting mysteries of massive footprints, a brutal demise, and even Teddy Roosevelt's story of a murderous encounter with a creature by man named Bauman. Brace yourself for a journey into the heart of an enigma, where the untamed wilderness conceals the secrets of a formidable force that drove an entire community to the edge of fear and abandonment. Nestled in the expansive wilderness of Alaska, the ghostly remains of Portlock Village tell a haunting tale of terror, centering around a mysterious and menacing force known locally as the Portlock Sasquatch. Established in 1787 by Royal British Navy Captain Nathaniel Portlock, this once thriving settlement faced an abrupt and chilling demise, leaving behind a legacy of fear and unanswered questions. The saga began innocuously in 1905, when villagers reported being harassed by a large nocturnal creature. What started as mere disturbances evolved into a series of unsettling events. The turning point occurred in 1931, when a lone woodchopper met a gruesome end in the forest. 
his demise marked by a single ferocious blow that exceeded the capabilities of any known human assailant. As the village grappled with the shock of this incident, hunters stumbled upon massive footprints near the crime scene. The footprints, measuring over 46 centimeters, 18 inches in length, hinted at a creature of formidable size and strength. Torn vegetation and traces of blood intensified the mystery, leading the villagers to confront an elusive and potentially deadly adversary. Eyewitness accounts added a chilling dimension to the narrative. Reports surfaced of a colossal hairy figure wreaking havoc on salmon processing equipment near the beach. The witness armed and ready saw the beast stare him down before inexplicably walking away without causing harm. Such encounters fueled uneasiness among the villagers, who were accustomed to the presence of local predators but found themselves facing a seemingly supernatural threat. The unsettling events escalated as bodies, likely the victims of the mysterious assailant, started appearing around the village, washed into the bay from the rivers that fed it. These grim discoveries suggested that trappers and miners had been surprised and killed in the hills and forests above Portlock. Faced with an increasing death toll and a palpable sense of fear, the villagers reached a breaking point. Efforts to safeguard the village included posting armed guards near the cannery plant, but the relentless terror persisted. The last remnants of Portlock's population succumbed to fear, abandoning their homes in 1950. Whatever lurked in the remote wilderness above Portlock, whatever claimed the lives of its inhabitants, emerged victorious. The Portlock Sasquatch narrative echoes tales from other regions, including an intriguing account from Teddy Roosevelt, Roosevelt recounted a conversation with a man named Bauman in Idaho, a seasoned trapper who narrowly escaped an attack by a huge, hairy beast. Bauman's conviction that he encountered a Bigfoot-like creature added a layer of credibility to the broader lore of such mysterious entities. However, the events in Portlock defy easy categorization. The creature, described as large, covered in hair, leaving human-sized footprints, and displaying a lethal strength, challenges conventional understanding of known wildlife, the abandoned village stands as a testament to an era marked by an enigmatic terror that forced an entire community to flee, leaving the legend of the Portlock Sasquatch intertwined with the untamed wilderness. Bauman's encounter in Idaho adds a poignant note, underscoring the broader cultural significance of such tales and hinting at a shared thread of mysterious encounters with massive, elusive beings that traverse the fringes of human habitation. The legacy of Portlock remains shrouded in mystery with unanswered questions about the elusive and deadly entity that forced an entire community to abandon their homes in an effort to escape an enigmatic terror that killed and dismembered fellow villagers. Thanks for watching this collection of cryptid videos. If you made it to the end of this video, then you are a badass, and we love you. We're still a small channel trying to move up in the ranks, and you are helping us in more ways than you know. If you are new and dig our videos, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us get noticed by the algorithm. And as always, stay curious. Welcome to my party, we're just getting started. A life is a dream or a nightmare starring. Hand me a drink, cause I think I'm going all in. Get me a shrink, who can catch me when I'm falling? Cover up my scars, flip the handlebars. Crashing in my car, wake up in a bar. I'll be a superstar, just on my avatar. This world is so bizarre. Yeah, straight to the face And I wanna get lost I'm sick of this place Don't know how to stop When I'm feeling this way So I'm taking six shots Till I'm feeling okay I think I'm going crazy Don't think I'll get on safe So I'm taking six shots All straight to the face I'm taking six shots Are you coming with me? I'm taking six shots Yeah, straight to the face And I wanna get lost I'm sick of this place Don't know how to stop We can't get a job that pays us enough I'm about to pop up Fuck you, you're lost We all know that we never really want a boss So I'ma do what I want to Something I can't undo Yeah, I'ma do what I want to Something I can't undo I'm taking six shots, 
Stare straight into the face And I wanna get lost I'm sick of this place Don't know how to stop When I'm feeling this way So I'm taking six shots Till I'm feeling okay I think I'm going crazy Don't think I'll get on set So I'm taking six shots All straight to the face I'm taking six shots Are you coming with me? I'm taking six shots Yeah, straight to the face And I wanna get lost I'm sick of this place Don't know how to stop 